What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Masters of Sport. I'm here with Earl Kunkel, co-author of Sports Performance Bible and Parabolic Periodization. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I write. Yeah. Right so we have a lot to discuss, and I've still been thinking of a lot of the same stuff that we've yeah. been talking about for quite a while. But whatever, it's long form, and... <laughs> No one, I shouldn't say no one. Most people aren't listening to these as they come out. Like they're going to discover them. Yeah, the that's line, fair. Yeah, and it's going to be a resource then. And you have to think about like how we're doing a, t- a time warp, if you will. We're sort of like we're projecting into the future. We're yeah. time travelers, and everyone else who deals with it will be projecting back in time to this moment. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to think about it. Oh yeah, that's awesome. We're like seersayers. Yeah, other people know what information they need then. I mean, that's also like, dude, thinking about a strength coach, sports performance, it's like that's like the goal is you're five, ten years ahead of the researchers. You wrote, like, tell me about your dissertation instead of I'm doctor. Like, that's more interesting <laughs> to me. <laughs> like, you meet somebody for the first time. Let me tell you about this the reactiveness of the gastrocnemius. <laughs> well, I don't, I think that that would be more interesting conversation to me. Then did you see the football game this weekend? Oh, yeah, that's true. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. I'd be like, wow, this person has some unique takes on things. Yeah, they have a a unique take on life in general. Speaking of football, (laughs) who is the greatest running? We may have asked this one, but this is more specific to what we're getting into. Okay. Who is the greatest NFL running back ever? Oh, ever. Yeah. You could even say right now if you want to, but ever is more fun. Uh, Oh, I mean, here's a okay. So here would be the argument. People would say Emmitt Smith. He has the most yards. Great running back. Great blocking. All right, I'm back. gonna stop you right there. Hang it's on. Barry Sanders. Yeah. Okay. 100. <laughs> percent I agree with you. Yes. Because uh, I was gonna say then people will say Walter Payton and dude another great running back, but Barry Sanders by far. Yeah, they're awesome too. They're great. Yeah. But yeah, it he. I would say Barry Sanders is what I would call the pro, like he was the proto modern running back. Yes. And then you have guys like Marshall Falk, Edger and James, like that whole era, yeah. Ladanian Tomlinson, who were the NFL running back now, like could yeah. do everything, if yep. you will. Yep. Like, I guess you can get away with just running the ball more since they do so many open sets. But there was that time, like 15, 20 years ago, when it was like, all right, you better be able to catch the ball or else, like, you're not yeah. an every down back. And yeah. You're giving a tell away. It's interesting now because, I mean, with football now, I was just thinking, like, you have someone like Alvin Kamara who's, like, smaller and just cat- very, very good at running the ball, clearly, but really, clearly more so a receiving running back. And then you have someone like Derrick Henry who's very clearly a running running back. Yeah. And it's, like, it's interesting how – like what you just mentioned with like L- like Ladanian Tomlinson or or Marshall Falk, like they could do everything. Yeah, you didn't know, as you didn't know what was going to happen. Like Marshall Falk, like it, it's, I, I don't think he's given enough credit. Me too, like being a low key Rams fan when I was a kid, <laughs> like he recreated the way the position was used, and I yeah. think Dick Vermeil deserves some that. credit with yeah. that too, because you see then someone like Priest Holmes have yeah. success as well in, in his system. Yep. Um, yeah, more of that. Yeah, I, I would say to to just echo. I think if you watch Barry Sanders, the other thing, the other thing that I want to say, they said he only ever had two Pro Bowl linemen in front of him. Oh wow! You know, whereas Emmett Smith's whole line was basically Pro Bowl. Now, granted, Pro Bowl has some superlative action to it, yeah, right? But as a line line play, though, you've got to yeah. be good. Yeah. But also, too, you're like Dallas. You're literally called America's team. Like, you have the most fans. Your yeah. probably retail numbers are through the roof. But I'm saying to, to argue, uh, the whole argument is that Sanders didn't have the line. Yeah. How about we make this argument? And he also lost up to, it, like, the one year they, they said he had lost, like, 190 yards on the year and still ran for, like, Hundred or eighteen hundred yards or two thousand yards that year because he would make so many risks because uh-huh. he knew they would pay off like at the end of the game. Yeah, it's like implied yardage. Yeah, it's like <laughs> I know I can take a couple of hits here if I because it'll open this up later. How about this argument? Matthew Stafford was a lifelong 
Detroit Lion. Spent one year on the Rams and it is now a Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe it says something about that organization. The organization in general. I mean, yeah. it was it wasn't as bad when Barry Sanders was there, but it was still pretty. I bad. think it was probably about the same. Like you had some super talented people, and it's like they couldn't. They why couldn't, can't we? They couldn't bring make it, it happen. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. Well, had leadership. The important part was we were talking about Barry Sanders, yeah. and to continue, as you said, rehashing some ideas we've been talking about in our future travels um, <laughs> around like reflexive strength. Yeah. Central pattern generators and the PSO. What's that one stand? The peripheral sensory organization. Self organization. Self organization. See, I wanted to use a bigger word. I wanted to complicate things yeah. instead of keeping it simple. Right. With my intent. <laughs> 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 Shit, man. Uh, that's Earl's an inside joke, everyone. Yeah, Earl's taking it deep here. Yeah. You want to give a quick rehash on? Like yeah. CPGs, just in case someone's rolling in and they're listening to this episode and not the previous. Yeah, so four CPGs. Plus. Yeah, CPGs would be central pattern generators, so they're responsible th- for things like sucking, um, sneezing, coughing, but also uh, walking, jogging, running, doing things that have rhythmic patterning. So even swimming, uh, and it's essentially a non-intent oriented movement as could be a a good way to describe it so if you have something that is more command driven uh my brain is like actively thinking okay i'm commanding my body to do this uh when and and think about your brain can operate multiple different ways so these would be pockets of like motor neurons that are inside your spine and uh your brain so there's like i think it's top motor neurons or upper motor neurons and then lower motor neurons uh And so now these neurons, which are types of of brain uh, cells and communication, they're essentially telling your brain and telling your body what's happening. It's from sort of an unconscious. Yeah, it's uh, it's like your intent, if you will. I think about it and I could be wrong, but like if I'm running something real simple, right? Yeah. Most people can run, not necessarily run well, but most people can run able-bodied people let me stress that and my goal is to run as fast as possible that's my intent run as fast as possible my cpg sort of your command starts the run but then your cpgs take over when you're at that high so like if i'm a running back and i'm thinking like i want to get as many yards as possible i start with the play right that's given say it's a zone or something like that so i know then my first intent is to get the ball and then my next is to find the hole in the zone yes but once i make that like those are my big command things right yeah everything else from that from that point on is is going to be much more i i think the best term would be semi-autonomous semi-autonomous yeah so like think about for anyone out there like autonomous movement would be like totally a a good example would be hitting your knee with like a reflex yeah you know it's totally autonomous it just happens yeah whereas this would be you still have the command action of the wherewithal of all right this zone blocking scheme against this defense is going to create this so you still do have that that's where the semi-autonomous comes yeah there's still percent like things coming in um that you're perceiving like and sights, this is where periphery. Act, act, yeah, and, and, and then, self-organization yeah. also is happening at this point too. All right, there we go. That's the PSOs then, right? Yeah. There, so exactly. then you're you're more aware of your surroundings and and you you're even feeling things, but then also seeing things and and taking measurements during this point. Yeah. Of of what's happening and the speed that you are expected. It, you know things. what's funny about this? So you can tell me how silly I am. When it comes to AIs and robots, they could get these AIs and robots to do math real easy, right? These parameters, these rules. Getting those AIs to walk and do human athletics. Smoothly, it's it's so hard. It's so hard. Yeah. So it's funny how we describe intelligence and brain working and give so much to like sort of white coat type of things. Yeah, but not. Where are more like basic athletic things are so much harder for our machines to replicate. And I know there, there are machines that are starting to do it 
pretty but well. It's been a lot longer. Look at how much longer it is versus a computer generated yeah. equation. And then they do their algorithms. They're so yeah. fancy. They yeah. know how to sort things really fast. <laughs> yeah. Let's pick up the patterns, but yeah. yeah. But in this um, case, they're not as good. But I mean, for, so take that for an example. Like you've seen robots walking. Imagine a robot taking, you know, taking. There's a snap. There's a snap, and and you know, running back steps to the left. Yeah. You know, and the the line. Maybe let's say the running back steps to the left. The line's blocking to the right, and the running back's es- essentially going to hit one hole, or he's going to see a cutback. Imagine a, imagine a robot trying to do that. Yeah, you know who I want to talk to me about this? Have you ever seen those, like, I bet you can't miss, like, YouTube videos where they'll, like, put something on, like, a bow and arrow? Yeah. And the machine will, like, quick adjust so it always hits the target? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if one of the, if someone... One of those creators, one of those like brains, Mark Rober type guy, could make that happen in sports. Maybe and not such a close skill sport, like super open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like throwing, they challenge can do it. laid down to Mark Rober. Yeah, where's your CPGs at, machine? <laughs> Get it together. <laughs> All right, back on course. Yeah. So I I think what's interesting, I. Dude, this is okay. So there's this is going to be a long-winded analysis of Barry Sanders because oh, they, should we tell him we want to talk about Barry Sanders and how he moves? Like yeah, so that's that, like our gist here. Like w- almost Dane has this thing, and uh, that you can train how to move like Barry Sanders. It doesn't mean you will be able to move like Barry Sanders, but you can train. But you can start developing skills to get closer to that like level, if you will. Okay, so think yeah, think here's here's the interesting discussion. And actually Goda, which is this weird training method that I think is all hocus pocus type stuff, they actually use Barry Sanders joint angles on how he runs to teach people that they train how to squat. And what's interesting is that Barry Sanders, I think, and, and actually LaShawn McCoy does have some very legit moves. There's there's like specific runners. Alvin Kamara is actually one of them too. That they run so jukey, yeah. And, and it's like look more like a basketball player. Yeah. And what's interesting with it? Paint. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It, watching watching Sanders is like he was so fast. He even though he was short, he did have a a, a good top end speed, but he was also stupid strong and explosive. Um, you know, he was known to back squat like six thirty five, yeah, deep. Like, but then at the same time, like that's probably what helped him cut on a dime. Where I'm going with this discussion a little bit is, first of all, Goda will teach people this to move like, or they don't say move like Barry Sanders. They do this really weird thing. We should just do a whole the video on. I'd it. have to. I look to. at this stuff. Send me what I need to like do to like be like. Ha-ha. Yeah, yeah. So. But they don't bring up the fact that Barry Sanders was as strong as he was in the weight room because everybody thinks that all these things have to exist se- separately. And I actually think where Franz Bosch is on with the CPGs and with the methods is that you could take something like the Euro step and get somebody to do it better. No basketball yet. Stick to football. Okay, so football, you could teach somebody how to do a jump cut and train this over and over again. And they will get smoother, faster, uh, better out of that position. So, and I think Barry Sanders, one, he's just genetically a freak. Let's just throw that out there. We already know that, right? That's already known. We don't have to discuss it yeah. further. He was a freak in the weight room, strong as hell. You could see it. He had massive hypertrophy in his quads. They were massive. That's also, you know, drive and acceleration was his game. Um and his strength. So the goal now would be what I've been doing is taking those videos, breaking down into a couple different chunks. Chunks. We've already come up with two or three different water bags. Reintroduce chunking again. Too. Okay, so chunking would be learning. Met, let's just say real real easy uh, concept would be memorizing. We use this example. Memorizing Pokemon cards. Mm-hmm. If I have 300 Pokemon cards, if I tried to memorize them one at a time, one page at a time, it it actually 
remember it's funny because I one page at a time would actually be like chunking if I memorized one right, page right 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 and then went back to the first page and mem- yeah. memorize them together you break it down into smaller chunks like yeah yeah that's, that's actually the good way to put it I was uh, gonna say all of them if they were all laid on a table and you just looked at them you couldn't do yeah, it yeah you but your brain actually goes to chunking naturally yeah you have to it's anyone who was pre smartphone and had a phone or pre cell phone. Yes, good example. Having to remember a phone number. Yeah. Like you'd remember the beginning the or three and then the yeah. f- like you, you I know it's simple, but everyone had to remember and it. And they all had their own their own technique. You know, yeah. I would go beginning and end and then the middle. Or I would go you know what else I would do? I'd go the first six together and then I would come up with a math equation for the last four. All right. So that's like <laughs> how I would go through my own process of yeah. chunking. So that's that's what chunking is and, and what we've done or what I've done a, a, a bit. It has been slowing down Barry Sanders' stuff and trying to break down basically like his top 100 to 150 runs uh-huh. into consistent patterns. And, dude, what's crazy is it's it's so hard. So what I'm hearing is you're basically doing a very intense film study. Yeah. And through the like film to the study. point where Caitlin's like, get off your phone. And I'm just watching Barry, <laughs> like, literally going, like, what are his steps? What yeah. the hell are his first two steps? Because oh, that's what I'm trying to figure God. out. I want to see his first his first step and then the next three because his first step is always crazy. Yeah, so you're looking for similar movements then that occur in these runs, right? Yeah, yeah. And then False basically step. like ed- – I don't want to – like editing and banking them into a movement pattern. Yep. And putting them into like here's a movement. So you just said false step, right? Yeah. Like, and then you have one like a jump cut, yeah, spin move or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So perfect. Now I'm curious, how many moves right now have you have you s- you probably seen a ton? But like, well, that's the other. That's the yeah. thing. It's like I I started to do like exactly that, and it's like it's I was up over like ten. All right. And to me, that's not as overwhelming as I thought. I thought well, it was going to be like 30. And dude, I was like, the, whoa. But here's the thing I'm probably only through like 20 plays. Okay. Dude, that's my problem is that, like to watch his videos and then see how he cut, it's unreal how complicated it is because he takes these like dead steps. Like, I, I, I don't know what the official name would be. But literally, like a dead step where he's not actually stepping, but he puts his foot down like he is, and then goes and will like lift that at the last second, and it sets up where his left leg's like deep, and he plants and recuts another. So it's way. almost like it's almost like a, a fake out with the leg, like where it's gonna it's like go, a double fake. or like a dance move to it. Yeah. Like I'm putting it yeah, in that note crazy. back. <laughs> And That's like, pretty. Th- the thing is, is that Mich- LaShawn McCoy, sorry, my shoe's untied. You're talking to your mic. My shoe's untied. This is <laughs> driving me insane. Uh, the funny thing is, is that LaShawn McCoy, when he was at his peak, had similar cuts. Not as outrageous, but very similar. But the longevity of those cuts capability was like two to three years. Barry Sanders did this for nine years. like Yeah. And, and I think that. Not that that plays into what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is just really analyze it and go, okay, if I can do like, if I can do this move with two steps, uh-huh. and it's basically like step stop, and I want to see a stop with the foot in the position that he's stopping, and then the next chunk would be okay, step stop cut to a box. Well, that's another sequence. Now we've got th- we got three positions there yeah and then to get to a point where it might be step cut cut to another box it's now, almost four. this to me and this is probably a little simpler is how at, when you first started doing the knees with weightlifting yeah some people yeah. were like why coach why are you that? doing that yeah, why are you too doing fast. that it's it's too fast. It's not yeah. happening. and it, it's the same mindset but it's applied to something way more complicated yeah. no offense to weightlifting like yeah it's boom boom this is way way more yeah you're asking way more so the chunking is like so necessary yeah and then i guess part of it you have these 10 right now and what you said 20 plays yeah so almost between every play you're Every two plays, you're getting one new move. You're like, what well, the other is thing is, on? in one play, he has three sequences of 
jukes yeah. where it's like, wait, he did this, then he did that, and then he did that, and then he ran 40 yards. It's like, what? Like I got to study because the other thing is the speed of, of entry into the juke is what I'm looking at. Like, yeah. And I, I'm just starting right now. All I'm starting with is when he's walking, where it's essentially like step, step, cut, whereas – the really complicated ones are when he's already out of a first cut and he's making another one. Yeah. When you have, it's essentially like it's like playing jazz music, right? Yeah. It's a line yep. it's a line it in the melody. Yeah, yeah. Here yeah. It goes yep. like yeah. here's my waterfowl dance for all my Elden Ring uh, yeah. people out there. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I think what's interesting and, and Earl and I just had this conversation where, you know, doing things is it worthwhile to do low corrective things or or movements that you know emulate or simulate uh competitive movements is it worth doing that if it like for for example if i'm a shot putter should i do shot put based movements in the gym or just keep it on the field you know this was a discussion we had earlier yeah and and my and my mindset so we do Banded stands, side medicine balls, and half you, turns. You have a pretty stellar lineup of shot putters within the country. And discus right? throws, yeah, and yeah, discus yeah. Throws, yeah, 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 yeah. So we 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 do a pretty good job with it. Yeah, um, you don't have a gold medal yet in the no, Olympics. not yet, but, but that's a goal. Yeah, so we do a good job with throwing. And if you look at throwing, that there's like special strength for throws. So special strength would be doing like half turns with a dumbbell. So yeah, it's not thro- it's not exactly throwing, but it's close. So my argument is that chunking movements, chunking reflexive movements and reflexive, these reflexive movements that are using CPGs typically at high speeds. Now, I, I view those movements as the special strength for sports. So here's outside of throwing where I think most coaches will f- like they're like, well, what does this mean for m- the fourteen-year-old kid? What does this mean for the seventeen-year-old kid? Because some of this stuff, I could tell you. <laughs> like some of this stuff is like, if I'm teaching this Barry Sanders stuff, like I'm not teaching this to everyone. Like this is something maybe. No, but you can chunk. You can chunk. Okay, it. so All that's right. that's the whole point. Tell me why I want to do this with younger Dude, kids, where it's it's it seems so complicated. Yeah. Okay. So so what I would do is like they should just be squatting like. <laughs> I, no, I I don't disagree that but now they go I I think this is where Bosch just to go on this quick yeah. as a quick aside I think that's where Bosch is making a massive error is that he sees these blanket statements like maybe uh metabolic uh adaptations don't have nearly the the impact on sports performance as neural adaptation so basically getting bigger and stronger doesn't actually transfer it's just focused on the speed of the neural drive yes to a point that's accurate but also get someone really big and really strong and train them this how to actually use and fire really yeah. well with bigger muscle and guess what they're going to fuck people up like, so it almost sounds like your argument is well if i can train an athlete to be big and strong why can't i train a big and strong person to pretend to be an athlete as well yeah yes and so what i what i would say now go back to your original question or you just have a combination of both a combo yeah. it's a combo that's how everything is Us, I, like everybody wants to like take these like very precise hard lines and it's like come on when are you gonna learn that this is not how life is well they're used to life being that way with their political system (laughs) correct so they they see this like the the idea of two viewpoints yep and one stance or the other is like they can't handle it yeah Yeah. and they can't handle the the gray area yeah and it's like come on like it's so much more complicated and most people know that yeah okay so so go back to the kid but it's easier to have an us and them mentality it is actually easier that's why it's us dane in the garage (laughs) strength if you ain't ain't with us you're (laughs) against us no we want everyone on our side yeah that's accepting and nice to people (laughs) not a racist (laughs) (laughs) fuck you're so right yeah okay so the seven-year-old teach him how to squat now you so the if you think 
a step, a drop lunge. Okay, you do yeah. a drop lunge. That's the first step to a lot of these situations. Shut your mouth. Oh. <laughs> so I'm just thinking of my six, my now seven year old. It okay. was easy to teach him how to squat. Teaching him how to do a curtsy squat was a pain. Okay, so let's just say he can't do a drop lunge. Can he do a split squat? That's the, that's the chunk. Then after a split squat, he does a split squat. He jumps in the air. He doesn't scissor. He just keeps there. Pauses. That's the next chunk. Why do you scaffold and all these athletic movements? So now I'm just progressing. It's yeah. a progression to the drop, drop step, cut to the left. You know, so now you're just chunking it. And it's, and it's looking at it through that lens. And if I can get eight, nine, ten-year-olds to start to, to, to get to this point, you know, I'm thinking about Lincoln because he's he's ten. Right. He, he does hockey. He's, he he and he plays other sports, right? If he can and he's get athletic, like his mom, not his dad. Yeah, correct, <laughs> exactly. And actually, what's funny is that if you study goalies, they're very similar to linebackers, and they're already having these these patterns. Okay. So let's take the example of a linebacker or a goalie, and you study consistent steps, and you execute them faster. If you can imprint them enough now that's where cpgs come into play gotcha. and you're making these predetermined command driven decisions that lead to the semi autonomous action from cpgs man good stuff dane i, I like but your you next level you have thinking. to tap your brain yeah. to get these thoughts this so is occur. how you turn your brain on <laughs> it's like, like kindergarten this. yeah anyone who's just audioing this and not like watching the film <laughs> Dane started tapping his head as he was <laughs> saying all that, and it, it was kind of funny. Yeah, <laughs> it, he just needed to start rubbing his belly at the same time. Yeah, yeah. really show how <laughs> hard that brain was working there. All right, so we we what I'm hearing is you have oh go ahead. Well, so he's wagging his finger at it me. It makes me think about a good example: of skating. It mm. skating is a sport. Wait, like ice, ice skating? skating. Oh, yeah, okay. ice skating is not inline skating. Either well, okay. either one. It's so it's so clearly an example where CPGs come into play, and when people first learn how to skate, it's so hard, and you're so focused on your balance, right? Yeah. And then over time, you start to figure out the stability, and then after five years, you you can skate fast and cut on a dime and do some crazy stuff because this is what's happening. Like your body is using these motor neurons and generating them more in these specific areas that it otherwise would not be doing. So it's a very clear example of how the body becomes coordinated over time. And it can learn these uh, new skills, new, new complicated skills. And it takes you back to now, you know, yeah. doing, applying this to, to sports. To teaching kids, athletes, how to move athletically. So, like, when you have football players who are coming in, and it's like, hey, yeah, I'm going to get you strong. Like, that's a given. Like, I can prove that day in and day out. Yeah. But I can also make you pretty more athletic than what you already are. Yep. And, hey, here's my secret sauce I'm sharing with people theoretically how I'm doing it. Yeah. So let's talk. I want to give an Go example. Ahead. Like, look, look at. I was going to say, give us a specific exercise or something. Okay. Well, okay. Do th what you were doing first. Well, I was going to say, look at. Jim Brown basically had to watch someone like Newt Rockney, like old highlights. Yeah. And then knew that he could add flair, right? Yeah. So then Jim Brown, you know, basically I would say Walter Payton, you know, watched Jim Brown, but made it better. And Walter Payton then spawned essentially. I know they played, I don't actually, they, they might not have crossed over. Uh, but then that led to basically Emmett Smith and Barry Sanders. Yeah. And so now and now in the league, let's just say, you know, we talked about LT and, and Marshall Falk and those guys. And now, you know, if Nick Chubb's healthy and Kamara and Derrick Henry, these guys, if they're they could be the next great ones. But the whole argument is that each outside of Barry, each level sort of got better and better and better. Yeah. And it's because the training improved and 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 all that stuff got enhanced. And this is the next step that we have to take. In to, strength training and yeah, conditioning. To, dude, we're getting yeah. so good at being Exercise, good. science, if you We will. have to get even better and do really creative stuff. You. Like, that's just the way we have to make progress. All right. Let's go back to this. So, we're getting better. Let's get on this new X. 
exercise exercises that you have developed. I heard you have that like water jug thing or whatever. Yeah, you yeah dude. Like that's so talk, fun. Talk to talk to this. Talk to these movements that have come out of watching Barry Sanders, you chunking these movements yep. in an effort to create more CPG type neural drive firing the body's ability to semi autonomous semi autonomously. Yeah. Be okay. More okay. So one thing just from trying to improve myself. I, I do try to read and going into dynamic trunk control. One of the things that you'll read is like people who are more agile run DTC, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. People who run with phenomenal agility. Think about a tennis player here. Dynamic trunk control is what they're using. If you have a tennis player who's running full speed to one end line slams on the brakes they they're completely under control they hit the ball back across their body precisely where they want and then get prepared for the for the return that takes a ton of dynamic trunk control now what does that have to do with football take barry sanders if you watch him run his torso doesn't move okay it's like just it's like a joystick it's it's not doing anything and so he has this phenomenal control there and then great mobility in his hips and his quads and his in his ankles and great uh power out of that so what i've been doing then is taking that and going all right i want to try and go zero step to four for barry sanders sequences and see what we can do how can i train uh dynamic trunk control so then i started to play around with the plates or play around with a dumbbell or kettlebell and then i basically saw some of this work with water bags. I was like, well, water bags could actually, in theory, add noise that isn't there. Yeah, a lot of noise. And make you more focused. So I've really, so I've been taking this now and just doing these steps with the water bag to stimulate the dynamic trunk control, which then forces a little bit more of an improved uh, proprioceptive response. So you may need, you're just a little bit more aware. You have better peripheral self-organization. Yeah. And then, PSOs. yeah, and then that leads to executing these steps as soundly as you can with this created scenario, created environment. And so that's where the water bag comes into play is doing that. And then what's cool with it, too, is you can also isolate certain areas and it because it's shaky, uh -huh. it forces a, it forces co-contractions. So now you're you're improving the 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 co-contractions of, of different groups in joint areas, which actually helps you cut better when you're when you're using it for the drills because it. So how many reps and sets is someone doing of like these water bag movements that are like co-contractions, DTCs, reflexive strength, improving the PSOs and the CPGs? Because it sounds like they're doing a ton from like a neurological sense yeah so like how much water i put six to five sets of two to three reps all right so on each side so it's almost like weightlifting or, yeah. right like yeah. in the amount you do it now water, as i was gonna say i would i would for us where we're at it's about like 35 pounds i think it might be i think i think we could go a little heavier uh-huh um, you always think you can go yeah that's here. fair that's definitely <laughs> fair i i think for women it it might be a little heavy but we haven't tested it enough all right so you do this how then do you get to actually test your results because all of this stuff dude you want to know how all right so so i was walking to the bathroom today and we've got we've got the the bathroom right and on the way there there's sleds and there was a box okay so I s there was a box a sled to my right, a sled to my left. So the box was more in line with the first sled. Now, I, I, I don't like this was just for fun for me being a child. Yeah. I was like looking at it as I'm walking to go take a piss. And I go, I'm going to jump off the box, the little red box, 12 inches. I'm going to land on my right and I'm going to cut to the left of the sled and then I'm going to land on my left leg and cut on an angle, plant on my right leg, and then take off straight. It was like a – because I was never someone who was yeah, super I've seen agile. Yeah, you run. You don't know how to pick your knees up. You I just, just like bowl. Yeah, yeah, you just yeah. stretch <laughs> your like foot f forward yeah, more. Exactly. Hey, that's okay. There's actually two types of, of – Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's actually not that bad. 
All right. Uh, Good for you, Dane. I'm glad you found There it. are knee shufflers that run. There are people that run, that run like that, like some of the best in the world. Michael Johnson was one of those. Really? Yes. Man, um, you're comparing yourself to Michael Johnson. <laughs> 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 no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but he yeah, has no chance. <laughs> I'd like to be as good of a businessman as he is because he is bright with that. Uh, anyway, going back to this is that talk about CPGs. He probably ran with powerful as hell. Yeah. Anyway, is is I I go okay if I go plant plant cut drive, let's see how easy I do this. And it, this was all in the span of five seconds, as I saw it laying out. And I and I cut cut cut. You know, then I just ran down the steps. I where I'm going with that. I don't know if you can really, and, and this is because we're just playing around with this. Yeah. It's not like it's been, it's been maybe a year, two years of us really, probably since the first time I had Sam do a snatch to the box, which might have been 2018 into 2019. Yeah, you've been doing reflexive movements for a bit. But it's just. But they weren't as complicated as they're becoming. Yeah. And they weren't as focused on what they're trying to address. Yes, that's a great way to put it. And and I and again and I, I think we were just scratching the surface and I didn't right. have quantifiable stuff feedback. You were just looking at the pictures and replicating them at that yeah, point. Basically. Instead of like it was like this looks like something. Let's figure it out. And then as you saw that you were like, Well how can I use it in this way? Just your natural curiosity and Yeah. You got a shovel and dug. Yeah, and, and, and so that's where we're at now. And it's like Maybe time, maybe if you had, and these things are getting a little more affordable where you had contact mats that would tell you feedback on like placement on, of your foot on the ground. Uh -huh. So you can see how long you're, you're making contact with the ground. Um, that would be another way, you know. The eye test is always there too, but. I, I think the eye test is probably the best. Yeah. It's just hard to quantify. The white coats it. would be, be like, yeah. that doesn't count. Well, yeah. if I film it, does it count now? Right. That's right? where you like, could with frames per second. Yeah. Um, I was just trying to think like, you always want, it, depending on, the, this is where it's interesting, is that depending on the tempo, and if it's a true plyometric, typically you want to see whatever you're coming down onto the ground, you want to see it like twice the speed back. Uh-huh. So you could do that, but it, the the only thing is with these movements is they're much more precise with, with you're not, it's not a true plyometric movement. Right. So like, I'm, I'm just trying to troubleshoot in my own brain the yeah. best way to measure. I think it would be, eye tests would be a priority. And then you, if you really wanted to, you have to go on force plates of some sort that are sensor okay. specific. Cause like weightlifting is easy. Like there's more weight on the bar. Oh, they got yeah, stronger. Yeah. It's so oh. easy to, to follow it. Yeah. That's what same with throwing. It's a distance. Yeah. It went farther. They yeah. make it so like the objective of the measurement is just so simple. Yeah. Like it, it's not complicated. Like you right. learned how to do that in first grade. Like, right. Right. So know. it, you still want to measure it though to a point because then you can see progress or or not. Yeah. You know, or when to. I think honestly, part of what I think is going to happen is that people will use, people will try to find and probably will. I, I don't know if this will be me. It'll probably be someone else out there. We'll figure out like these impact another more measurable movement. Okay. So maybe it's a vertical jump. Maybe it's a a double leg. You know, for a while soccer world-class soccer was using uh double leg triple jumps to determine like explosive endurance and, and okay and how well they they could handle speed and stuff so it's like you might see if those increase or if the the rate increases in some sense you know another movement impact that or maybe it's even like uh, what do you think about creating a test yourself i mean it could be like a, a muscle snatch you might see it drop off a little wow, i do really well at that one <laughs> <laughs> but you could see the speed drop off possibly yeah because it's not overly challenging uh i'm trying to wise. think if uh with these reflexive movements if like you built a test you know how like oh i want to see their power output so we do a vertical jump test or like a a long jump like is there sort of the I would want to see a a depth drop into a side jump into a single leg land, and be like, how many stutter steps? How quickly can they apply force? So you on would the look hold? for speed and reaction, for stability. Yeah, reaction and stability. There you go. You should start testing that with everyone. Like as um, I don't know. Like 
and you could even do height too, right? Yeah. Based off the power. Yeah. So like maybe they start can at like six inches and yeah, drop and, and, and see and build it up. Yep. And then that could be your that's your baseline for it, and then see what growth you get from there. What's interesting with that is I was just thinking like one of the factors with Barry Sanders is that he makes cuts sometimes. I have one that I created where he like drops his knee forward, and it looks like he's about to put his knee on the ground and then he just at the last second places his left leg down and cuts. And so I was doing this with like a almost like falling forward. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Bring the foot out. And that's what made me think about that six inch box to a 10, you know, to an eight inch to a 10 inch. A lot of these like best athletes in the world, they would, you would be able to figure out where they take their, their most dominant steps. What degree Okay. Like you could be like, oh, they they're gonna be best trained on. Seems the like you box. have another test that you just have <laughs> in your head too, based off like the depth into a single leg into whatever the next movement is. Dude, you know what's funny is that. I mean, to be fair, I think there's some areas of sports performance where they're funded well, but like this is an area where it's like, a lot of these guys that are in the universities. They don't even – they can't even think of this because they're not around athletes every day. Well, they're thinking more about the measurements yeah, yeah. than the actual movements themselves and how to develop it. Yeah. And they're trying to look at, like, the output number that some machine or some instrument itself is generating. Can spit back to them. And th they're thinking about that instead of, like – sometimes they're it's like, dude, just look. Yeah. Like, get rid of that middle thing there. Right, right. That's why the, the white coats is – and now – I do want to say this. We don't hate the white coats. No. We just like to poke fun. It's yeah. like a friendly banter. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I don't have they been poking at us? I haven't noticed. No. No. Well, hopefully they start. Maybe yeah. somehow you can get like a teammate in this. Like you can get some white coats like on my side. I mean, yeah. ideally I think that's You can have an army of white coats. That that's what what well, I have uh, Luke D. Virgilius is getting his PhD at uh Eastern Tennessee. So like, Okay. Uh I, I do think that that's what happens is that, you know, Charles Poliquin, uh, he was sort of tight with a guy named Bill Kramer who's at UConn. He was at Penn State for a little bit as well. Worked with uh, Vladimir Zatsiorski. Like, he had him in his sort of pocket. Not pocket, but yeah. like they were close. Yeah, they, they communicated. Yeah. Like, each respected what the other had to say. Yeah, I think that I think that's where it's like, f for my – the th dude, it's hard to find people in academics that aren't pompous assholes who just think like they don't want to hear anything you have to say. I got you. It's it's really hard to find that because they're just gonna. It turns into like I like because they're stuck in a building all day. It's so much like I know more than you. Well, I also think too, academia has like this political banter to it that most people are unaware of. In like, how do you get like your tenure? How do you get the yes. published? Like, yep. it's in a sense, it's really cutthroat. Yeah. So like, that's fair. And you, you come and make your name through this cutthroat like institution, yeah. if you will, and like it, like you said, the funding. Like you want that money. Yep. And if you're talking to somebody else who hasn't put in that work that you did, yeah, it, and they think they're sm as smart as you, you got to put them in their place. Right, and it could just, I don't know. That's sort of like teachers in general. Some of them are like, yeah, that. some of us can just be mean. So maybe the the lesson here is, one, coming up with a test to analyze this stuff, but two, yeah. finding a, a white coat in my back pocket <laughs> that yeah. I could talk to at least about it, and then three. Be friendly, Dane. I'm trying I'll try. Yeah. Third step, those keep watching more Barry Sanders. Dude, Caitlin gets so mad because she'll be like, what, "You just this is all you're doing." Should I apologize to Caitlin for that? Because <laughs> I feel like I was like, "Here, let me just like this match." <laughs> <laughs> Throw it on you up. There it goes. But the thing is, she's she's so well accustomed to me doing this throughout my life. It's like, okay. you know, if it wasn't you know back when we first met, it was Craigslist and eBay. You know. And that happened for to a while. To build the gym up. Huh? Yeah, basically. <laughs> and, then, and then you look for old trucks, right? <laughs> and like, then it turned into, uh, you know, whatever it is. There's always some weird thing I'm trying to obsess over. But to be fair to myself, it's been a while with figuring this and, and some other things around 
uh, performance. Yeah. All right, let's go to the audience questions. RJ Brummett. RJ? How do I develop a more powerful pull in freestyle butterfly swimming in the weight room? Ooh. I, dude, free, freestyle butterfly, I would tell you closer grip, uh, closer grip pull-ups, explosive pull-ups where you let go, catch, and drop. Uh, like weighted pull-ups, obviously, and I honestly really believe muscle-ups carry over well. In like ring muscle-ups or yeah. like bar muscle-ups? Both. Both. I like ring better, um, and then also I would say sled pulls with a rope. I always think one rope of the climb. silliest things with muscle-ups is people would say, oh, bar muscle-ups are easier than rings, and uh, I always found the ring to be, to be easier because there was so much freedom with where your body could be Yeah. to get there now. I'm not a gymnast. I'm not yeah, good so. at that. But that, like, I could do that before I could do a bar muscle up. Because a bar muscle up, if you're like not in the position, it's yeah, if like, you're just slightly out of the groove, yeah, it doesn't go for you. Anyway, that was a silly aside. Yeah. So All right. That um, would be what I'd do though for him, for RJ. RJ, there you go. Um, this one's from the Discord. Ooh, this is super. <coughs> Garden. It's a three instead of an e. <laughs> X. How about programming for the military training? What's your opinion about that? Uh, Thanks I, in advance, buddy. Yeah, so I would say that that's a good question because, you know, what branch? Is it law enforcement or, or is it just military? Um, isn't that all, like, endurance stuff, though, too? It, like, it is and it isn't. I, I, I think I think that's got to be the foundation is right, you know like how many push-ups can you do in this time can you how many pull-ups like? so that's where that's where i think i would go is like look i do believe you should be doing some type of endurance training twice a week at least if you're in the military uh -huh. and it should be one day you might maybe you're doing like super hard sprint intervals one day you're doing uh long slower distance that's not taxing but it's just like 30 minutes and you just go i love how you think 30 minutes is long well Based on the research, you know, <laughs> 30 to 60 minutes. I'm kidding. But then, and then you would get, you would get like maybe a day in there that might be like five minute repeats. Okay. So let's just say something like that. But then you could do what I would do in the weight room would be one day I'm going to lift. I'm going to push my legs. One day I'm going to push my strength in my upper body. And then basically one or two days of, of calisthenics, like push ups, 50 push ups. 50 pull-ups back and forth you yeah, know do you do um when you push the weights do you train more high rep the whole time like do you ever go for a one rep or you're like all right i'm gonna go for a five rep like if you're if in this case i yeah. would say i think once in a while you can you know once or twice a year you plan like all right i'm gonna push a dead and a, a big bench okay you know but uh, the rest of the time you're really focusing on your endurance work and and your calisthenics really yeah. but you're still doing enough strength work to to stimulate yeah. some good growth well i always think speaking of strength work the muscle, wait, is that the, what's it called? Why can't I think of it? The miracle grow. The miracle grow. I was going to call it a muscle grow. Muscle grow. grow. The <laughs> muscle grows. The miracle grow, I felt, was the greatest movement ever when it came to calisthenics movements in CrossFit. Okay. Like, it directly helped, like, dips. Pull-ups, dips, Handstand everything. Handstand push-ups. Because like it, it's working lats and triceps, dude. Every thing. And You're it overhead. Like, so, anytime someone was like, I want to get this movement, I was like, well, you should do this. Yeah. And just lengthens your lats. Yeah. Gets you overhead, targets your triceps. You have to squeeze your gut. Yeah. Maybe that could clickbait some. Yeah. Where with Do that. this to master calisthenics. Yeah. That's a dumbbell exercise. Calisthenics CrossFit, two C's of athletics or fitness. <laughs> I don't know. All right. This one's from Reddit. F and U V P. About more than a month ago, I pulled my TFL tensor fascia lat latte, latte, upper hip muscle. I was on a weightlifting program to boost my doubles, kind of like the LSUS. Yeah, LSU Shreveport. Okay. The thing is, I feel better, but once I snatched, I felt a slight pull again on my way up from the hole. Is it best to ease my way back in with reflexive training? Uh-oh. This is a big fan. I tried to warm up with band walks and couch uh, stretch. I would do couch stretch and, and band walks. I think that's fine to, like, target that area to get it rolling. Uh, and then what I would do is, you know, so if you're standing up, it's a hip hip extension when you felt it. Uh, 
side plate swing to a hip lock. So leg goes back, swing back up, hold overhead in a hip lock. When the plate comes down and you're swinging it down to one leg on the right side, the left leg extends back and it's not you're only supported over your, your right leg and you swing it back up so you get a uh, hip extension uh, in that right hip. So then you can isolate the side and do that to try and to try and warm it up. That nice. would be my first go to. Cool. Yeah. And if it persists, go see a doctor. Yeah, PT, go see like, somebody for sure. There's nothing wrong with that. But I do think that's a, a good a good f- you know f- first step and maybe you play around with one or two others maybe you add a twist in there to see if you can yeah. feel it and, and that might help nice is there any others no that was three that's a lot we usually oh, only do two so make sure that you watch your barry sanders highlights tonight yeah. girl cultivate your power dane until next time your brain power later <laughs>